completion of the chronicle, awarded him with a gift of 50,000 silver aspers and, a, and, and fine robes. And we can sort of register <coughs> something of the relative significance of this gift through the register. This is a, uh, a register of the gifts given by the court over a 10-year period. And in that entire register, this is the single largest gift for literary patronage in, in the 10-year span. So it's a quite important work uh, in the early 16th century. In this sense, through the direct backing that he received while writing and through the copying and diffusion of the work, we can observe the concerted efforts of certain elements in the court to put Bittisi's history forward as an officially endorsed image of the Sultan and the dynasty. Despite such great gifts, Bittisi was unhappy with the treatment that he later received. He accused two high-ranking statesmen at court of conspiring to keep him from the just rewards that he felt he truly deserved. And you can see here how he reflected on these gifts, characterizing them simply as kind of the, the nuts and raisins you would give to appease a child. The difference between the rich reward and Bittisi's reaction can be understood in terms of the extremely high expectations that he had. After all, he was a learned and high-ranking statesman who arrived, in his view, in the, the boonies of Islamic lands and felt that his work for the dynasty was worthy of a top appointment. The friction caused by the mixed reception of the history eventually led to his decision to abandon the Ottomans around 1511. With the accession of a new Ottoman Sultan Selim in 1512, he was invited to return and served as a close advisor to Selim. During Selim's reign, Bitlisi doubled down on his hyperliterate approach to historical writing through the composition of a history of the Sultan in Persian. Both in Hasht Behisht and this work on Selim, Bitlisi explains his motivation in terms of a desire to bring to the Ottomans the cultured and well established tradition of historical writing in the Chancery style. He writes, well, before me, he says, there, there had been absolutely no deserving and worthy works in the canon of accustomed historical writing that had informed its reader of their innumerable exploits and commendable acts. This canon of accustomed historical writing necessarily reflected a ch the Chancery style, which would employ the full range of rhetorical technique to memorialize the Ottomans. In this sense, Bidlisi clearly conceived of his work as revolutionary. He had brought the best method of expressing historical knowledge in the Chancery style favored throughout Persian lands to a new cultural space where the Ottoman dynasty was in the midst of developing an innovative <coughs> imperial idiom. Bidlisi also offered to the Ottomans, through these histories, the new vocabulary of sovereignty. Here, he drew directly upon nearly two decades of experience in the Aquilian Lu court. Through this experience, BBC had been exposed to the vocabulary, including titles such as Renewer of the Faith, Mujeddid, a term taken up by, Ottoman, by Aquilian Lu secretaries under the impact of earlier <coughs> Timuric chancery practice. Perhaps through exposure to renewal, tajdid, as a political term of art, <coughs> BBC adapted the concept to his new Ottoman patrons within Hash Behisht. In the work, Osman, the founder of the Ottoman dynasty, was the renewer of the 8th Hijri century for his successful efforts to bring order and justice to Anatolia. In his own day, BBC points to his patron, Bayezid II, as the renewer of the age, a paragon of justice and order during a period of chaos and uncertainty. BBC's approach caught on. After his death in 1520, Several Ottoman chroniclers and statesmen of Suleiman's reign applied Bidisi's same rationale in defining Ottoman rulers through the title Mujeddid. So in all of this, we can see clearly how a term first deployed in a Timur context over the course of the 15th century spread to courts in western Iran, and eventually, through the movement of a Persian emigre, found expression in Ottoman lands. But the Aqqoyun of Chancellery did not simply adopt the Timur titular wholesale. The secretaries in its chancery, in turn, adapted the terminology to their own specific tastes. This process is most discernible in Bidisi's most favored title of sovereignty, khilafet rahmani This is a term he uses throughout his works from his Ottoman period, but it was also a term he had picked up from his Aqqoyun Lu days. In the, in the 1480s, Khalifa Yerahmani became closely associated with the Aqqoyunlu Sultan Yaqub. 
Bitly C, in a prose notebook that he kept from this period, refers regularly to Yaqub by this title. Several other scholars from the Aquilino context made use of the term in their own works. For instance, Bitly C's colleague, Kunji Isfahani, brought the term with him when he migrated eastward to the Uzbeks in Transoxiana. Bitly C, who moved westward in the opposite direction, consistently applied this title to his new patrons, the Ottoman sultans. Indeed, in all of his works of a political nature, so histories and other treatises, Bidlisi refers to one or another Ottoman sultan as the embodiment of the vicegerency of God. Khilafat <coughs> rahmani as concept and term, drew upon the Timurid formulation of Khilafat ilahi This conception of the caliphate was completely distinct from juridical definitions. In contrast, the term was grounded in theosophical Sufi conceptions of man's place within the cosmos and philosophical notions of man's ideal ethical comportment. So by way of illustration, I realize this is a very long passage, which is important as the highlighted words, and I'll discuss the whole passage. So here we have a, a long passage from Bidlisi describing Khalifa Yi Rahmani, and highlighted um, here is what he has to say. Bidlisi's use of vicegerency draws heavily, heavily upon theosophical cosmologies that distinguished humankind as the sole created thing with the potential to encompass and actively comprehend all of the attributes of God that were reflected passively in his creation. This cosmology placed Adam and his descendants at the center of the cosmos. For scholars with a theosophical bent, such as BBC, the central and unique status of Adam and his descendants marked humankind for the vicegerency of God. The outward expression of such khilafa was signified by an individual's perfect justice, which was defined as possession of the four cardinal virtues of Aristotelian ethics, or the state of equipoise, as I've rendered, <coughs> rendered it here in this passage. So these are courage, restraint, <coughs> wisdom, and justice. Generally, this kind of vicegerency connoted an inward disposition attained through mastery of spiritual matters. That is to say, it was an inward, personal, spiritual concern. Bidlisi, however, like his Timurid forebears and Aquinu colleagues, consistently applies the terminology and its underlying concepts to questions of temporal authority. So among, I mean, among the Ottomans, he uses the term throughout his histories and other political uh, treatises consistently. Under <coughs> Bidlisi's auspices as well, the term enters other kinds of official usage. From his position within the Ottoman court as respected Persian stylist, Bidlisi on several important occasions was asked to formulate official announcements explaining Ottoman policy. On at least one occasion, Bidlisi applied his preferred term of sovereignty to a prominent document of Ottoman ideology. The document in question was the Ottoman victory announcement of Selim's conquest of Mamluk Syria and Egypt. The, the letter required a delicate explanation of Ottoman aggression toward a fellow Muslim polity. Perhaps not surprisingly, in defense of the Ottoman policy, he drew upon the innovative yet broadly resonating vocabulary of sovereignty first developed by the Timurids. He explains the Ottoman aggression in terms of the prerogatives of the vicegerent of God. And he writes, as the highest goal and most lofty aim of possessing the seat of vicegerency of God, is limited to strengthening Muslim faith, repulsing the effects of oppression, and raising unbelief and apostasy from nearby lands. As a, as a result of all of this, Selim favored fighting the unbelief and apostasy of the Safavid enemies. In the same vein, he necessarily waged war against the Mamluks, who had failed to protect the Muslim community from the Safavid threat, and indeed were in alliance with these enemies of Islam. <coughs> More generally, the acceptance of these ideas within Ottoman ruling and administrative circles is equally important to explain the emergence of a new universal vocabulary of sovereignty. During the reign of Selim, the vocabulary seems to have caught on within certain bureaucratic subcultures. Among provincial secretaries and administrators, elements of the vocabulary were included in the prefaces to several provincial law codes completed during the reign of Selim. Here, the quotidian work of provincial secretaries is crucial, for it underscores the acceptance in some measure and reinforcement of this outlook in Ottoman lands through its adaptation and reproduction 
and the basic bureaucrat bureaucratic products of governance. To be sure, the precise formulae worked out and proposed by BPC were in turn transformed and domesticated through the pens of subsequent Ottoman secretaries. Yet they helped constitute the basic building blocks upon which Ottoman functionaries continued to articulate sovereignty well into the 16th century. During the reign of Suleiman, the vocabulary continued to enjoy great currency, even in the most public of settings. For instance, in, in a victory proclamation read at Friday prayers in Bursa after the Ottoman victory at Mohach in 1525, Suleiman throughout the proclamation was referred to simply as Sahib Quran, as his only name in the, in, the, in the document. Moreover, Suleiman's long-standing chancellor, an architect of the Sultan's bureaucratic and ideological platform, someone named Jalal Zadeh, Mustafa, accepted fully the new vocabulary in, in his own hyperliterate Ottoman Turkish history of Suleiman's reign. Yet the experiences and impact of these three figures were not solely marked by success and influence, a fact crucial for understanding the broader trajectory of Ottoman imperial culture in the 16th century, as well as, in fact, their relative obscurity. The obscurity of two of them, Maulana Munshi and Kazizade, would seem to suggest that their career and intellectual legacy was something of a mixed bag that left only a fleeting trace on Ottoman ideology. I think there are two basic features of these men's experiences that allow us to explain their ambiguous place. The first concerns the networks of patronage upon which these men necessarily relied in order to make, in order to make it in Ottoman lands. While it is certainly true that all of them arrived in Ottoman domains with years of experience, none of them knew very many people at court when they arrived, and this was of crucial significance for their inability to rise within court circles. The second feature is perhaps the more consequential, and it concerns this, the shifting cultural terrain of the Ottoman court in the early 16th century. The problem, in some measure, for these Persian emigres is that they chose to write in Persian. So this may contradict in some ways what I'm saying, but uh, in some ways, certainly, this was not a problem. In the late 15th century, Persian is uh, uh, the language of prestige. But at the, in the very years that Bidlisi is writing, the Ottoman court was awakening to the possibility of a hyperliterate, high-registered Turkish. It was a Turkish that would absorb the best qualities of the Persian chancery style, yet it would be construed in the common idiom of the court. One of the statesmen who spurned Bidlisi's history was in fact a major proponent of this new approach. Around the time that Bidlisi presented his history, this scholar statesman put forward one of his own students as the ideal candidate to write a chronicle of the Ottomans in this nascent hyperliterate Turkish. And this history become the famous history of Kemal Pasha Zadeh, who's one of the leading figures of Suleiman's early reign. In this sense, these Persian emigres were respected and in certain areas influential in their own day, but they were not frequently memorialized by later generations in the same way as their Ottoman colleagues. This shift from cultivation of hyperliterate Persian to the foundation of a new, confident, imperial Turkish idiom was by no means a straightforward, linear process. Even in the latter decades of Suleiman's reign, the court patronized regnal histories composed in Persian verse. In the early decades of the reign, and this is the last Persian emigre I'll mention, one more Persian emigre was promoted by Suleiman as a major articulator of the sultanic image. The man was named Shah Qasim Tabrizi, and like the earlier Persian emigres, he too has largely been forgotten. Yet reference to his experience, I think, underscores the basic point about the alternating trajectories of Persian and Ottoman Turkish within the empire in the 16th century. In the Persian chancery style, he composed a fine and detailed account of Suleiman's campaigns. In the introduction to this history, he argues that all of the Ottoman sultans should be understood as Sahib Quran. He uses the term Mujaddid. He uses all of the vocabulary. The work in many structural respects, narrative approach, and ideological claims or a striking resemblance to another historical work of the same period. This other work was the Ottoman Turkish history of the Chancellor Jalalzadeh. Yet despite the similarities, the older work of the Persian emigre is completely unknown, while Jalalzadeh's work goes on to become a classic of the 16th century and its author one of the most famous stylists of the period. The interrelated contents, yet diverging reception histories of these two works, in some ways tells the whole story. 
the Ottomans certainly did accept the Timurid vocabulary of sovereignty and the Chancery style as introduced to them by Persian emigres. Yet ultimately, they insisted upon describing such sovereignty in the new hyper-literate Ottoman Turkish language. Persian persisted, but increasingly Ottoman Turkish constituted the appropriate idiom for imperial discourse. This last point should not, however, detract too much from our evaluation of these emigres. In a particular time and a particular place, their work and thought mattered a great deal. <coughs> they introduced the refined and prestigious style and ideological content of Persian historical writing to the Ottomans. Such a style had coalesced from a much broader cultural intellectual context within Islamic lands and lent legitimacy to Ottoman rule at a critical juncture when it was rapidly expanding eastward into Muslim territory. DPC and the other emigres were key vectors of a major new mode of legitimization for the Ottomans, even if, soon after their appearance, both the style and content of their writing were translated into and appropriated by a new idiom and cultural outlook that marginalized them. And in, in this respect, there are maybe three larger points that I'll end with. First, <laughs> Studying sovereignty draws us into matters of aesthetic sensibilities, political theology, and all manner of image making, not simply as an ex expression of a ruler's individual prerogative, but as a broader expression that sometimes involves unlikely or forgotten figures. Second, studying sovereignty clearly suggests a history of ideas, but it can't remain a study of ideas as a, solely as an abstraction. These ideas mattered in particular ways at particular times, and so they need, so we need to register precisely how they were deployed, adapted, and domesticated in the more basic quotidian work of rule. When we're mindful of all of this in an early 16th century Ottoman context, we see that the trajectory of sovereignty at this time is not simply a matter of internal evolution within the dy dynasty, court, or even wider Ottoman society. Rather, it is something profoundly connected with a much wider cultural and intellectual Islamic landscape, even in a period where distinctly Ottoman cultural forms were simultaneously taking shape. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take questions from the front. Um, I was going to ask the first question myself. Um, 